stakeholders are put all together and asked to fast forward to 2050 to determine the plausible future realities for agriculture. To tell us what they hypothesised, I'm joined by Dr Jen Taylor from the CSIRO. Jen, you were part of this cohort of individuals. What a huge task. How did it I happen? I know, but how much fun, Lindsay, really, to hop in a time machine and go forward to 2050. So what we were asking them is from their perspective and where they sit in all parts of the industry, what do they think, what are the challenges they see coming and what do they think needs to be solved for us to have a thriving industry, landscape, agriculture sector and rural communities in 2050? And we left feeling really challenged but also slightly scared and slightly excited by the end of it, yeah. I found the findings of Ag 2050 so interesting um, because it's not all sunshine and roses. We no. need to talk about the things that could really derail agriculture. Can we talk through a couple of the scenarios? Yeah. I know one of them relates to um, systems and regional ag capitals. Yes. So we came up with, well, from that room, we actually collected more than 14 drivers that people talked about. And then we sort of brought them together in these four scenarios that you mentioned. So there's one of them is regional ag capitals. And that talks about us getting sort of technology, skilled workforce hubs in rural communities. And they're driving sort of a sustainable intensification. They're doing in-region manufacture and that we're really meeting some of those emissions and sustainability goals at the same time and creating value. So that's, that's a good scenario, but all of the scenarios have trade-offs. We work in a system, so all of them have trade-offs. So regional ag capital says, you know, we could achieve that here, but maybe not in all areas. And so what would that actually look like, a regional ag capital? Yes, so, you know, so imagine if, um, energy, the way we produce energy is vastly different. And imagine if you could produce energy almost free on farm. Then, you know, you could consider technologies such as water security through desalinisation. You could consider on-farm nitrogen production. And then the workforce around that becomes much more skilled, much more technologically enabled. Yeah. Another of the scenarios you looked at is a hot topic here at Beef, landscape stewardship. Yes. Who's responsible for this natural capital? Yes, exactly. So that, that scenario talks about, OK, we've gotten really good in managing emissions, we're really good at carbon sequestration, these sorts of things, and the landscape and agriculture are really well integrated. Agriculture is actually a big lever to meeting our sustainability goals. And so then, you know, we've diversified ecosystem services and our, you know, global credentials are, are large. So that's also a fairly positive scenario. But it means we put priorities on certain things, um, you know, and, and uh, we, we're get, capturing our value in a slightly different way from the agricultural sector. Yeah. Scenario three, climate survival. Yes. So that, that basically talks to, none of these scenarios are do-nothing scenarios. So climate survival is our, essentially our current trajectory. So we are doing good things. We are um, meeting and addressing the pace of climate change. We're, we're doing those sorts of things. But... Perhaps we're not at the front of it, um, we're responding to it, uh, in, perhaps in some fragmented ways, and we, we could do better. Yeah. And the final scenario looks at a kind of the worst case scenario, right? It's called system decline. And basically in that scenario, um, it, it kind of talks about we haven't quite landed some of these national scale programs. We haven't worked together to solve these rather complex issues uh, that are coming from climate shocks, climate change, um, some of the market forces to gain access to markets and maintain that with biosecurity and value. So really in that scenario, um, yeah, there's no, there's no big step change in how science and technology is addressing what's needed. Dr Jen Taylor, it's so interesting to think about where ag could go and the changes we need to make now. What do you want people to do with the report? Yeah, so it's online at the CSRO website. There's four scenarios there and, and what they unpack is what you might start to see if we're headed to one scenario or another. But it's really just what we're going to use this is talk to the science and technology community and say, OK, what is the shortest path between where we are now and the next 10 to 15 years, which is how long science and technology takes, to make sure that we hit those more, you know, beneficial scenarios. It's uh, been a really interesting task, I imagine, too, bringing all of those stakeholders together. How long did the process take? 
Well, it took us about 10 months to get it together and we're still going. We're still we're still talking to lots of people because, you know, we, we really want to get this roadmap right and, and find the fastest way that we can get some solutions out there into the industry because it is a decade long process, some of it. Yeah. Dr. Jen Taylor, thank you so much for joining us from the CSIRO and some interesting news in from the Murray Gray Society earlier this week was that the first ever shipment of stud cattle will be making their way to the African continent, continent, uh, continent I should say, uh, via Botswana this week and also the royal family in the UAE have uh, made a purchase of a number of Murray Gray cattle as well. Well don't go anywhere, we will be right back looking at the Japanese luxury breed 